spirit shoots out. Well, of course. Amen. Oh, he's the one that works. Right. <laughs> Standing on the promises. Yep. You know, I have to thank Paul for he tries every week to come up with something that kind of goes along with the message title. And the message title today is to stand firm. So that was a good song today. Sing we go on. I appreciate his attempt. And he says sometimes if there's not, nothing that kind of fits, he says, what should we sing? He says something about Jesus. <laughs> for the Bible. Lord, we thank you and praise you for your word this morning, God. God, we ask that you open our hearts. Open our ears to hear, our minds to receive. Lord, I ask that you would anoint me to speak your word this morning. We ask this, Jesus, in your wonderful name. Amen. Amen. And just uh, to mention... We forgot to mention, next week after church is our annual business meeting. So please plan on staying a little bit after church. We need to have our members here in order to have the meeting. And that will take care of our meeting for the year. So there's no voting that needs to take place, so it will be a long meeting. And also next week we will have communion. It was brought to my attention that this is Communion Sunday. And we will have it next week, rather than try to scramble. Um, Patty used to get that together for me and always remind me the first Sunday of the month. So I might have to find somebody to take her place till she's back. But that was very helpful. I mean, she would have it all ready to go. And I said, like, oh, oh, I would have forgot. So we're going to look at God's Word today and the message of stand firm. Galatians 5.1 says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Yes. This verse, I thought, was very appropriate for the times we live in right now. We need to stand firm on the freedom we have in Christ. Because there are those that are trying to put upon us a yoke of slavery. Trying to make us slaves to the state. But we need to stand firm on Christ. And Christ has set us free. In Exodus 14, 13 through 14, it says, And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. What a word to the people as they were standing before the Red Sea. The Egyptian army approaching them. <clears throat> Moses, what did you do? You brought us out of Egypt just here to die here in the wilderness. They were grumbling. So easy today to grumble. Look what they're doing to us. The Egyptians, they won't let us gather. They're telling us we have to stay home. We can't have church. Well, I'm saying fear not. Stand firm. And what are we standing firm on? Christ. We're standing firm on our relationship with Christ. We're standing firm in this country on the Constitution that I believe God inspired. Yes. We have rights. And one of those rights is to gather in freedom to worship our God. That's why Moses kept telling Pharaoh, we need to leave Egypt. Pharaoh, we need to go out and worship our God. Pharaoh would say, okay, and then he would change his mind. No, you can't. It just sounds a lot like what we're going through. You can have church. No, you can't. You can't go out and worship your God. Well, you know what? I'm praying that the plagues of Egypt will come upon those that are trying to shut down our churches. Amen. Because we're going to go out and worship our God. And Moses says, fear not and stand firm and see what the salvation of the Lord if we stand firm on the promises of God, if we stand firm on our faith, we're going to see the salvation of the Lord. But if we don't stand firm, we won't. Reminds me of when uh, the people were asking Jesus about John the Baptist, and he says, what, what were you expecting to see? A reed waving in the wind? What does that mean? See, we don't, he was not a reed waving in the wind. 
That's something that bends and swings every direction the wind blows. We're to stand firm, not to be a reed bending every way the wind blows. Okay, I'll do what you say. Okay. Sometimes we have to stand firm if what we're being told is not right. And we're going to talk about how we stand firm. A lot of people say, well, the Bible says we're to submit to the authorities over us. Yes, we are to submit, unless that authority is telling you to violate God's word. And in this country, if that authority is telling you to violate the Constitution that we live under, because it hasn't been changed. Amen. And study the history of this country. I believe God's hand, like Mark said earlier, was in the forming of this country. There were so many things that should not have happened. How did a, a group of colonies beat the greatest army in the world at that time? And drive them back and gain their freedom if God had not been on our side. The phrase stand firm from his stemming in the Greek, when used in a military sense, had the idea of holding a critical position while under attack. Paul mentions our need to stand four times in Ephesians 11, 13 to 14. Essentially, he says the wobbly Christian, the one not serious about God and trapped in sin, cannot stand in this war. He will be destroyed. We are in a war. The battle we're in is not against flesh and blood. We'll see that as we read in Ephesians. It's a spiritual war. We need to get that up here. Not let what we're seeing going on in the natural. We're seeing in the natural what's been taking place in the spiritual. We're just seeing what is bleeding over into the natural. There is a war going on. That's right. And Paul tells us where to stand firm. One of the ways we stand firm is by being prepared. If you're not prepared, how are you going to stand firm? How do you prepare for a spiritual battle? Ephesians 6.11 says, Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to do what? To stand against the schemes of the devil. How many know Ephesians and the armor of God? Spiritual armor, the helmet of salvation. We're to remind ourselves every day, my head, my mind is protected by my salvation. Because I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And he says, I have a sound mind, not a spirit of fear, but a power, praise, and a sound mind, a mind that does not bend to every wind that blows. The breastplate of righteousness, we put on His righteousness. When your prayer is sometimes in the morning, you say, God, I'm putting on your righteousness because my righteousness is filthy rags. That's what the Bible says. It's never going to stand up to God's righteousness because I'm always going to dirty up my righteousness by doing things that are wrong. So I put on His righteousness. Put the belt of truth around your waist. How do you know the truth? The truth is only found in one place. It's right here. In God's Word. Amen. Not in man's Word. In God's Word. And... Yeah, it's okay to read a lot of books that Christians write, but that's not necessarily the truth if it doesn't line up with this. Everything we read and study, it's okay. There's some great books that we, some we recommend that help us understand God's Word. But when you read a book by somebody else and they, they reference a scripture, but they don't put it in the book, look it up. Make sure it's actually saying what they're claiming important because this is the truth and it's been protected through history People say, oh that's an old book how can you trust that old book it's been changed so many times it's been reinterpreted so many times that is a lie yeah it's been translated into different languages to try to help you understand what it said in the original language but they say what we have today is 99.98 percent the same as the original yeah, there's some slight variations, very slight, but they don't change the story at all. They don't change the meaning of the passages. This we can rely on it, we can trust it. It's God's Word. So we need to be prepared. 
But we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. I had to wait until you don't wrestle against flesh and blood. See, we're trying to do a lot of times a battle in the flesh. And that's going to wear us down every time. Because if you're not doing a sp the battle in the spirit, you're going to lose the battle in the flesh. Right. It says, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. That is who we are doing battle with. It's a spiritual warfare. There are spiritual enemies that are trying to defeat us. And we need to learn that and understand that. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. Paul says it again. Why does he say it twice? To get it through our thick skulls. Amen. He's going, people, come on, take on the full armor of God and stand firm. You know why? Look who you're fighting against. Take up the whole armor of God. Get it through this thick skull of yours that you can't do battle on your own. You cannot stand firm on your own. You'll fail every time in your own strength. So that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to do what? Stand firm. We live in the evil day. Yeah, there's been many evil days throughout history where it gets worse and at times it gets worse than others. But we are definitely in an evil day. We need to recognize our weakness. One of the reasons we fail in doing spiritual warfare, and that's warfare that is done in prayer. Just in case you don't understand what spiritual warfare is, the way you fight the battle is to get on your knees and pray. Believing that God is going to answer your prayer. If you don't believe that God can answer your prayer, you're already defeated. We need to pray believing, but we need to pray. That's what we do battle. Well, I, you know, how can that do anything? I'm just talking. Read the book of Daniel. God sent an angel to bring him an answer. And he continued praying, I think it was for 21 days. When the angel appeared, he said, I've been fighting a battle to get to you for 21 days. And because you could kept praying, I was able to make it. What if he had given up? Don't give up. When Jesus taught us to pray, he said, ask and you shall receive, seek and you will find, knock and it will be given to you. And the original, that means keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. It's a war. You keep battling the enemy until you defeat him. You don't go thump him a little bit and then walk away and think that does some good. We need to be like, originally this wasn't in my message, but Mark gave me a good example this morning. David. When David went to, to see what was going on with this battle with the Philistines, he was appalled at what he saw. The whole army of Israel sitting around, whoa, is us. Look at that big guy out there. He is so big. It's only one of them. And it was an army of them. Why didn't they rush him? <laughs> oh no, for what, 40 days, wasn't it? You said 40 days. And David shows up because he has to go check on your brothers. You know, he shows up and he's going, what are these people doing? They're all sitting around. And that guy is defying our God. He is defiling our God with his mouth. Why isn't somebody shutting him up? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. So they try to put armor on him. You know, like trying to do it in the flesh. <laughs> I can't fight this stuff. <laughs> Why am I going to try to wear Saul's armor? This, you know, Saul's a head and shoulders above everybody else. I'm a shorter guy. This stuff doesn't fit me. So what did he do? He picked up his weapons. Do you pick up your weapon? The armor of God. The sword of the Spirit. He picked up five smooth stones. Yes. Why? Because he was afraid he might miss with the first one? Oh. No. Because we find out later on that Goliath had, depending on the translation, four brothers or four sons, there were four other giants that were killed later on. That's why he had five stones. David never intended to use more than one. He never entered his mind that he would miss. That wasn't even, he never even thought about that. And when David returned after the battle, how many stones did he have? 
He had five. Read it. It says, and David put his hand into his bag and he took from it a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead and the stone sank into his forehead so that he fell on his face to the ground. Yes. And then it says, further down, then David took the Philistine's head and brought it to Jerusalem. That's right. Where was that fifth stone? Oh. <laughs> it was in Goliath's head. <laughs> he came back with as much as he left with. And he never had any doubt that he would kill that See, we need to approach spiritual warfare that way. When we get, come together to pray and to pray for our nation or to pray for something, we need to start with, I am going to win this battle. Not with, I hope, God, I hope you'll hear me. I hope that you'll hear me. How often do we do that? I'm guilty of it. Oh, please, God, hear me this time. God's going to stand. <laughs> You know, get some faith. We just have, God, this is the way it is. Our nation is in a terrible situation. Prevail, God. Have your way. Yes. See, that's how we need to pray. Your will be done. That's what Jesus taught us. He didn't say, God, I hope your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Is that how he taught us to pray? No, he said, thy will be done. See, no doubt. And believe me, i got to learn this too. We've got to recognize our weakness. Sure. 2 Corinthians 12, 9-10 says, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. His grace is sufficient. He knows we're weak. We need to understand we're weak. We can't do it in our own strength. But whose power makes us perfect in weakness? His power. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardship, persecution, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Yes. God says we're to be humble, accept our weakness, yes. and seek His strength. If we're feeling weak, we pray, God, fill me with Your Spirit. Give me Your strength right now, because I don't have my own. Instead of like, oh, I just don't feel like it today. I'm going to stay home. <laughs> Turn on the TV. Watch, listen to the radio. I don't have enough strength to go down there and pray. You know what? There are times all of us are weak. Sorry. Believe me, there are some Sundays I wake up and I feel weak. And I get down here. Why? Because one, that's my calling. It's not just my job. It's God's calling on my life. And I don't want to fail my calling. But believe me, there are times that I, I don't feel like I can do it. But when I get here, then He refreshes me. And I feel the strength. It's the same with all of us. We need to get recognize our weakness. But when we feel weak, turn to Him for the strength. God, I don't feel like I can do it today. Help me. And he will. We need to depend on God to stand in the battle. And that kind of goes along with our weakness. We depend on him. When we recognize we're weak, then we don't depend on ourselves. Like I said, we will lose the battle every time if we're trying to do it in our own strength. You are not going to win a spiritual battle doing it in the flesh. Flesh is not going to, you know, it's not going to defeat spiritual things. We have to be in the spirit and recognize that we are weak and God is strong. It says Ephesians 6 said, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. That is where our strength comes from. So when we feel weak again, that's when we enter into prayer. God strengthen me. And keep asking Him until you feel that strength, that surge of energy enter you where you, yeah, I feel strong right now. Push that weakness aside. 2 Timothy 2.1 You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. It's His grace that gives us strength. Grace is, is God's unmerited favor. We can't earn it. 
He will give it to you because He loves you and He cares for you. It's getting what we don't deserve. But He will give you that strength. Not because you deserve it, but because He loves you. Remember, the difference between grace and mercy is not getting what you deserve. We don't get what we deserve, which is death. That's what the Bible tells us. Separation from God. We don't get that because of His mercy. We get the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives because of His grace. Because He loves us. He's there to strengthen us. Jude 24. Now to Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. It is Him, it is Jesus who is able to keep you from stumbling. There are times that we're going to stumble. But God is going to pick us up and restore us. You remember the story in Jeremiah about the potter. He saw a vision of the potter. And the potter was working on and the pot. God, don't mess up. Anybody ever try to throw a pot on the potter's wheel? I tried that in high school. I wasn't real good at it. But you get it. Just look like it that water. You hit it wrong. That thing would just go into a mess. So what did you do? You pressed it back down and you started over and reformed it. See, that's what God does with us when we stumble. He just presses us back down and forms us back up. Yeah, that's good. That was the vision that Jeremiah got. We need to remember that. We're all going to stumble at times, but He is going to restore us yeah. when we turn to Him. We must be disciplined. 1 Timothy 4, 7-8 says, Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, <coughs> excuse me, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. So, yeah, physical exercise is good to an extent, but that we need more. It has some value. But godliness is of value in every way. Are you living a godly life? If you find yourself stumbling off on the wrong path and you're not living the way God wants you to live, get back. Because that has a lot more value to you than exercise, is what it's saying. How many like to exercise real hard? Some people love it. It's not my thing, but it's becoming my thing. i got to get out and move a certain amount every day. Doctor's orders. Amen. And the, and, the, and the bad thing about it is my wife was at that at that appointment with me. <laughs> so I couldn't come home and say, yeah, he told me you got to make sure you sit in the chair all day long. <laughs> no, he says you got to get up. Half hour of movement every day. Walk. Exercise does something good, but you know what? It's even more important for spiritual warfare that I live a godly life. Wouldn't matter how much I exercise physically, but went to the gym every day and I got all buff. Not going to help me win a spiritual battle, but living a godly life is. Because I guarantee you're not living a godly life and you try to fight a spiritual battle, guess what the enemy is going to do? He's going to throw it right back in your face. When you get on your knees and you start to pray, God, I'm praying for my country. I want to see it change. I want to see you take rule again in the country. And Satan will say, you can't even rule your own life. Remember what you did yesterday? That's right. <laughs> oh, and all of a sudden your mind's going on that long, horrible, you know. Yeah, yeah. He just starts slapping you with it. That's why we don't give him an opportunity. We live a godly life. Godliness is a value in every way, and it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. 1 Corinthians 16, 13-14 says, Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong, let all that you do be done in love. So Sam, we need to stand firm in our faith and do what? Act like men. That means be disciplined, be strong. That's for all of us. Ladies just act like men and women. Yes. In other words, be mature. That's what it says. 
Be mature. Don't be a child. Be mature. You're supposedly supposed to be more disciplined as you get older. <laughs> well, we're supposed to. Doesn't always work that way. We can learn a lot of bad habits along the way. James 1, 6-8 says, But let him ask in faith with no doubting. When you're praying, ask in faith, no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. If we approach prayer with doubt, we've got to spend some time dealing with the doubt before we really enter into our prayer, because then we're just a double-minded man, blowing in the wind like the waves. And Satan will try, that's one of his weapons too, he will try to put doubt in your mind. Oh, God, it's not going to do that. Why are you praying for that person to be healed? God's not going to heal cancer. Are you kidding me? I mean, that's what the devil starts doing. And we need to deal with that doubt. Shut up, Satan. You're a liar. See, just address it. In the name of Jesus, you get out of here. I put my faith in the Lord. See, that's how we need to pray. Drive him out. Get rid of the doubt that we're no longer double-minded. Otherwise, we're just wasting our time, is what James is telling us. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Be immovable, steadfast, stand firm, is what he's telling us. We need to learn to stand firm. And I know a lot of preaching a lot to the choir. Because you're standing firm. That's why I see you every week. You, you, you're really working on that in your life. But we can all fall back into being a reed and blowing in the wind. It doesn't take much. It's just listening to the lies of the enemy. Again, when you start hearing those lies, confront them. Satan, you're a liar. Get out of here in the name of Jesus. We have authority in Jesus' name to ask Him to leave. We have authority, not in our own strength, not in our own, but in His name, to bind on earth, it says. Whatever we bind on earth will be bound in the heavens. I bind you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. You have no authority over my life. That's how we pray. Get out of here in Jesus' name. But always remember, it's in Jesus. It's like stamping it. See, the kings back then had a signet ring. When they stamped that on anything, the document, that was the law. We're given authority, and that meant you were, and if the king gave you a piece of paper with his stamp on it, you were in the king's authority. He gave you his ring signet. You were in his authority, acting in his authority. That's what Jesus did. He says, you have authority in my name. Use it. Yes. 2 Corinthians 10. Why don't you go ahead and read it for us. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, who pulling down strongholds. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 4. Mighty in God. Yes. The helmet of salvation. Are, yeah, are the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the gospel of peace that we cover our feet with. That means to carry it with you, to take it out. The shield of faith. Our faith shields us from the fiery darts of the enemy. When he tries to throw stuff at us, it's our faith that will quench those darts. And then our weapon that we yield. The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. You know God's Word, you can quote God's Word. Satan will flee. Read the passage about Jesus when he was in the wilderness and Satan tempted him. It was a battle with God's Word. He smacked the devil with God's Word, and the devil even got kind of wide, and he tried to use God's Word out of context against it. And what did Jesus do? He just quoted right back to him, smacked him again with God's Word. The devil doesn't want to hear God's word. 
And if you can't remember at that moment, but you're under such attack and you can't remember a Bible verse, there's a simple one. Jesus wept. Every child in Sunday school remembers that one. You can, if that's all you remember, say, Satan, Jesus wept because of what you're doing to me right now. <laughs> Amen. You know, you'd be amazed and then all of a sudden other verses will start coming. But he can get it so twisted up that John 3.16, how do you know that? You know, just he does not want to hear God's word. If he's attacking you, God so loved the world, that means he loves me, Satan. Leave me alone. Use God's word. That is our weapon, our powerful, mighty of God. We really don't. It's hard for us to believe that, but because we're seeing things in the flesh. What do you mean you yell scripture at somebody? That's not going to stop when you're not yelling scripture at a person. You're you're dealing with spiritual beings when you're doing spiritual warfare when you're in prayer. That's right. And you can't think in terms of the flesh because the spiritual things of God are, are foolishness to man. Yeah. They make no sense to us. But it'll drive back the enemy. That's right. So remember that. And that, that's a good reason to start learning a few Bible verses that you have ready in your arsenal. Yeah. A lot of you have God's Word right on your phone with you all the time. Have it so you can open it quickly. And when the enemy's attacking, start reading it. You know, if you haven't memorized it yet. But it's, a good, it's good to try to remember. It doesn't matter. If you remember the scripture, you can't remember the exact address. It doesn't matter. Just quoting God's word. Let's bow our heads and pray. Those of you here today, how many of you would say today that I have struggled in battling and standing firm I need God's help. Put your hands up. Put them back down. Heavenly Father, I pray for those that have been in the battle that have struggled. We battle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and rulers of darkness. And our armor is not, our weapons are not carnal. They're spiritual. Lord, for those that struggle in the warfare that they're in, that you remind them that they are equipped. When they accepted you, Jesus, as their Savior, you clothed them with the armor that they need. You gave them the helmet of salvation. You put upon them your righteousness, the breastplate of righteousness. They carry with them the truth of your word and the gospel of peace on their feet. Lord, let their faith be the shield to block the attacks of the enemy and remind them to wave the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Lord, I pray for your strength for those that at times are feeling defeated and weak in the battle. Remind us, Lord, in that time of David that when he approached the battle, he never doubted. He knew he was going to kill that giant. He knew what the outcome was before he began. Lord, help all of us approach spiritual warfare that way. That we approach it in prayer knowing what the outcome is going to be. For faith is the substance of things hoped for, the things not yet seen. That we approach in faith believing it's already happened and that we are going to see it come about. And Lord, I pray for our nation. Our nation is going through a, a, a deep spiritual battle right now, Lord. Lord, we know that you are in charge. And we ask that you would turn things around, that you would shine your light upon all the evil that is in the world right now. That you'll expose the corruption, Lord. That the enemy will no longer be able to hide. But it will be seen easily for those that want to look. They'll see what is going on. For our fight in this country right now is darkness against light. You are the light of the world. You can scatter the darkness, Lord. 
But we know that when you shine your light, just like when we turn on a light, the, the cockroaches scatter, God. And there's going to be a time of unrest and uncertainty as the scattering is taking place. But give us the hope that we find in you. Strengthen us, Lord, I pray, by your Holy Spirit. You did not leave us alone, but you gave us your spirit to be with us every day. We are not orphans left by ourselves, but we are adopted by the King. We are children of the King of Heaven. Help us to remember that every day. We ask that, Jesus, in your precious and your wonderful name. Amen. Amen. And if you want to... <coughs> I want to wait just a minute.